I didn't quite get the point across when we were discussing the Global Energy Balance Network. This was to do with our paper published in the British Journal of Sports Medicine called You Can't Outrun a Bad Diet. And this produced an international outcry and a questioning of exactly who Coca-Cola was funding. And it turned out that this was a front. The Global Energy Balance Network was a front for Coca-Cola. And they have since been forced to stop funding it. And the organization, you can go to their website, essentially doesn't exist anymore. And the point was that Coca-Cola set this up to be the media, where the media goes for comment on any obesity issue. But the media wouldn't have known that this was funded by Coca-Cola. And their goal was not to talk about obesity. Their goal was to confuse the public, in my opinion, and to continue with the argument that obesity is due to calories in, calories out. And it doesn't matter where the calories come from. As long as you're doing enough exercise, you will be able to control your weight and be healthy. And the point of our article was that there is no evidence for that statement. That it is clear that it's what you're eating influences your body mass index, body mass far more than how much physical activity you do. And that acts through the hunger mechanism, which we've described. You see, the complexity of this is, for example, in my own unit, when I was still a professor, we, I didn't understand it at the time, but there was work being done funded by Coca-Cola. But it was minor work and we were only peripheral to the research. And the scientists will tell you, but we can get no other money from where, anywhere else. And Coca-Cola is helping us promote physical inactivity. But it's much more than that. It is finding the scientists who will continue to give the message out that is incorrect. And I indicated to you there were two very good scientists who've been lecturing in the American College of Sports Medicine for as long as I've been there, 20, 30 years, on the importance of physical activity in promoting health. And they unfortunately sold out to Coca-Cola. And that was the one we exposed him very clearly. So that, that's how subtle it is, because the scientists want to do the research because we believe physical activity is important. Where are we going to get the money from? We'll accept where it comes from. And so we fall into that trap and we get funded by companies who have another agenda. And this is a classic example where there was another agenda and the public weren't aware of actually what was going on. And, so, and that's why it's so difficult to get the message out. And today we're going to begin very briefly looking at the obesogenic environment. And I've cut the slides short because I just want to make one or two very, very important points. So I'm first going to quote Zoe Harkomb. And you'll see she, on this book she has the BA and MA. So Zoe Harkomb is an interesting lady because she has an MA in statistics and she's still trained as a nutritionist as well. She's written this book, but she's also a scientist and she's just completing her PhD and in fact being examined in the next few weeks. And the focus of her PhD is what was the evidence available in the 1977 when the guidelines were changed? So what was the scientific basis for changing the guidelines? And we'll come back to that paper that she wrote. She's also looked at the science behind the idea that you must have five servings of vegetables and fruits. And we'll come back to that. So, and she, because she's a statistician, she can go through the, the, many of the claims that are made, for example, that meat causes cancer. She's gone through the studies very carefully to look at what's the evidence and how has the science been slightly changed to make the message come out rather more easily for the public. So I'm just going to say that what she said to me summarizes the problem. And here's what she said, and this is page... Five, page, 550, page 551, Madam Chair, Volume 6. And this is a very important point she makes, that the obesogenic admirer didn't creep up on us, we made it. And we have to take responsibility for making it, and if we want to reverse it, we have to reverse it. So when people talk about the obesogenic environment, they do say that it was if there, it were some inexplicable phenomenon that crept up on the world and made everyone fat. We created the environment, it did not happen to us. We told people to avoid real food and to eat processed food. We passed legislation to ensure that trans fats and sweeteners were put into the food chain. We allowed our children to be given toys, cartoon characters and junk food by strangers, the strangers being industry. We have facilitated the comprehensive infiltration of the food and drink industry into our dietary advice, nowhere more so than in the fattest nation on earth, America, where we've gone so far as legislating the relationship. It's a very important point. In America, this is the point she's going to make. So that only the food industry-sponsored American Dietetics Association can advise the unsuspecting public. And it's something we have to 
we have to keep in mind, do we want a monopoly of advice in nutrition? Because this is what happened in the United States. And if you have any time you have a monopoly, that monopoly is open to control. And I've shown you how Coca-Cola has been so powerful in controlling the messaging around obesity in the United States of America. We welcome food and drink industry funds turning global sporting events into advertising arenas for their products. We continue to revere sports and pop stars who have paid millions of dollars to endorse products that they likely do not consume themselves. And she continues, We do not need to look far to understand why. The most nutritious foods on the planet are the fat protein provided by nature. Those are the real foods that we talk about in the Real Meal Revolution and in Raising Superheroes. But the most profitable foods on the planet are the carbohydrates provided by the food manufacturers. And this is an important point. We demonized real food. We said it's not healthy for you because it contains saturated fat. So you've got to stop eating real foods and we've got to eat all these other processed foods. So as the demonization of real food has gathered pace, fledgling and long-standing food and drink companies have become multi-billion dollar empires. An immense and profitable industry is growing on the back of the low-fat, high-carbohydrate advice that we invented. Human beings have become high fat and low health in parallel. So that's the point that we're addressing, that we're living in this obesogenic environment and that is the cause of the problems that, that we describe. That one of the areas, other areas that industry tries to make sure we get confused is on sugar addiction and so that they have scientists or they have other people saying that there is no such thing as sugar addiction. But the reality is there is, and this is the work done by Nicole um, Avina, who's probably the world's leading authority on sugar addiction. And so that's why I entered this, this article on page 289 of The Discovery, because she goes in great detail through all the evidence that, that sugar is addictive. And it has numerous uh, references and people who say that sugar is not addictive have to address that paper and say, why is she wrong? And so Dr. Avina, who's the world one of the world authorities on this, suggests, su we suggest that sugar, as common as it is, nevertheless meets the criteria for a substance of abuse and may be addictive for some individuals when consumed in a binge-like ma manner. This conclusion is reinforced by the changes in limbic system, that's a part of the brain that is involved with addiction, that are similar for the drugs, for addictive drugs and for sugar. So she's putting sugar in the same glass as addictive recreational drugs like cocaine and heroin. And so she concludes, the reviewed evidence supports the theory that in some circumstances intermittent access to sugar can lead to behavior neurochemical changes that resemble the effects of a substance of abuse. According to the evidence in rats, intermittent access to sugar in chow is capable of producing a dependency. This was operationally defined by tests for binging, withdrawal, craving, and cross-sensitization to amphetamines and alcohol. In the aggregate, this is evidence that sugar can be addictive. So that's a terribly important point when we talk about an obesogenic environment which is full of sugar. It's all hidden. You don't see it. It's not the sugar you add when you're tea. It's the, the food, the sugar that was hidden in the diet. And it's there because as soon as you take fat out the diet, you have to replace it with something. And we talked at length about the, the evidence from the last 300 or 400 years that you either crave fat or you crave sugar. And as soon as you start to crave sugar, you reduce your craving for, for fat. And I would argue, as I did two or three days ago, that it's the desire to eat fat, which is the healthy desire, whereas the desire to eat sugar, which is what we replaced in our foods, is unhealthy and addictive. On Friday, I showed you the influence in the United, in the United Kingdom the, under the article sugar, sugar Spinning a Web of Influence, and we showed how the two major organizations, like the Medical Research Council unit in Cambridge and the, the, the committee that, com, that advises the United Kingdom government. And then on the outside, you'll recall, we had all the funders. And then when I pointed out to the third slide, you saw the interaction, how they all tied to the funders on the outside. So the advice that's been given in the United Kingdom is being directed by industry. And that clearly, what are they interested in? They're interested in selling product. So they're not ultimately interested in protecting the health of the nation. So I thought that was a really good evidence for how industry has inveigled its way into controlling the scientists who are giving the advice. And I've, again, when we went back to the evidence from Dr. Blair and, and Dr. Hill, how easy it is to start 
giving out the the message of industry because it's it's just so rewarding for doing that your career takes off and you've got all the money you need it's very difficult to stay an ethical scientist away from that if you're in an area that's not being funded and and physical inactivity by and large for example is an area that's not being funded so it's very easy for the scientist to go down the slippery slope and then who, who who's recognized as the experts in nutrition it's the ones who got the funding to do the research but where does the money come from so when when government wants to look at people who are going to draw up the dietary guidelines, they look at the people who've published the work and they forget who's funding the work, who is the silent partner in the background, and what is that silent partner doing, and what is the interest of that silent partner. So where in the guidelines, any dietary guidelines that I've read, do they talk about sugar addiction? But yet sugar is a, such a fundamental component of our diet. It's so fundamental that people have made documentaries on it. For example, that sugar film, which was made by a group of Australians, has become the best-selling documentary ever in the history of Australia. It's an astonishing video, which goes and looks at the hidden sugar in the environment and in all the foods that we're eating, and makes the, the conclusion that we're, we're addicted to the sugar, and that's what's driving our food choices. I suspect the guidelines do mention the obesogenic environment, and everyone's concerned about it. And I. I I, I'm sure I've read that the, they're concerned about the obesogenic environment, but, but it doesn't take a step further and say, actually, this is what we have to do. We have to go back to the way we used to eat before the environment became like that, before industry started selling us processed foods.